In our last video, we looked at everything we expect from Apple in the next year in terms of iPhone, iPad, Apple Watch, and Apple's audio range. And you can check out that video just up here. But it is time now to turn to what for me is the most exciting stuff, Apple Silicon and the Mac. And make sure you hang around right to the end where we'll discuss the Mac Pro and the ridiculous performance that the reported 32 performance core SoC could be putting out. We did maths. For the latest Apple news, rumors and leaks every weekday at 12 UTC, join us in the iCave. That was Siri. Thanks, Siri. And I'm iCave Dave. And if you want the latest Apple news, leaks and rumors each weekday at 12 UTC, hit subscribe, ring my bell and let me know in the comments that you've joined my notification squad for a shout out at the end of our next video. So this video is about Apple Silicon and the Mac in 2021, but before we get into that, let's talk Apple TV. It's appropriate that right from the beginning in its first form, the Apple TV was actually a Mac running a modified version of OS X 10.4 Tiger and the now defunct front row interface. Released in January of 2007, it was sold until 2010 when the second generation 720p version was released, powered by the iPhone 4 and first gen iPad A4 SoC, the first generation ever of Apple Silicon. Since then we had the third gen 1080p model with the Apple A5, the fourth gen which was marketed as Apple TV HD with an A8 SoC inside from the iPhone 6, and the Apple TV 4K in 2017 with the A10X Fusion 6 core SoC. So what should we look forward to in 2021 from Apple TV? The latest rumours have centred around a new version of Apple TV getting beefier chips, although there's no real consensus on which chip that will be. Reports are split between an A12Z from the current iPad Pro line and the A14, the current processor in the iPhone 12 and iPad Air. And to be completely honest, the performance between these two SoCs is as close as makes no difference. But why does Apple TV need more performance? Most streaming platforms are just a USB stick or an HDMI stick. Apple TV is one of the key devices to Apple's services business, not just being a HomeKit hub, but also an access point for Apple TV, of course, uh, Apple Fitness Plus, Apple Music, and Apple Arcade. And the last thing Apple wants is for their games specifically to be held back by TV hardware. So with upgraded internals, Apple TV would be sitting just like the iPhone 12 on a 4202 multicore score and 9229 for metal, which is the equivalent to a GeForce GTX 760 on graphics performance and an Intel i5 1038NG7 quad core from the 2020 Intel 13 inch MacBook Pro. That should be plenty to run some pretty decent looking games that are specifically optimized for these platforms. There have also been multiple rumors of Apple designing their own gaming controller, especially for Apple TV, but that could also be used with Macs, iPad and iPhone 2. While I can't imagine much that Apple would bring that's new to a controller in terms of physical hardware, other than their excellent haptic feedback perhaps, the AirPods style automatic switching between devices would be a really neat trick. Apple could also include quality accelerometers in the handsets to give Wii-like motion control options to perhaps integrating some of this with Apple Fitness Plus for better workout tracking. That extra performance could also allow Apple TV to use the same technologies as Sidecar on the iPad to expand Mac screen real estate with very low latency as the architecture is shared between the new M1 based Macs and Apple's A series processors. Perhaps even some of the processing for those displays could be done on board in order to reduce load on the Mac itself. And speaking of the Mac, let's get into that. And let's start off with Apple's lowest price notebook, the MacBook Air. The MacBook Air was originally introduced by Steve Jobs in January of 2008 and the computer in an envelope has come a long way since then. Its original form factor was the world's thinnest notebook at the time at 1.9 centimeters with a 1.6 gigahertz Core 2 Duo processor and two gigabytes of RAM. The current generation of MacBook Air, of course, was the first Mac, admittedly only by a few minutes, to be introduced with Apple Silicon's M1 power, boasting a 3.2 gigahertz eight core CPU, a seven or eight core GPU, and eight or 16 gigabytes of unified memory, all as part of the SoC. In 2021, I'm expecting that MacBook Air won't be getting any updates until at least September, more likely October, but bringing the M2 SoC based on the same core architecture as the A15. Assuming that Apple's single core advances are roughly in line with what's happened in the past, I would expect a single core Geekbench performance to be around 1950 and multi-core around 8450. While this might not seem a huge improvement, it does mean that the MacBook Air will pass the current highest end Intel iMac from last year, running the Intel i9-9900K. 
that's a full desktop processor that isn't trying to manage battery life and this MacBook Air will be able to power past 15 hours without being plugged in. More important than the upgrade to the M2 though is what I think they will do with keeping it an M1 equipped version around with a reduced price point. A MacBook Air SE could have just a single configuration available with a small 128GB storage option and 8GB of memory only and probably retail at 749 The low storage and minimal memory configuration would keep the MacBook Air SE as a great entry point for anyone on a major budget but still be differentiated enough that it shouldn't hurt the brand new M2 MacBook model with memory and storage options open. I could see that it would work great as a convertible, dock into larger displays and more storage at the desk, but able to grab and go when it needs to. It would be perfect for students and schools as a business notebook for field sales teams who mainly go for spreadsheets and work off VPNs and servers over the air. Of course, 128 gigabytes is a compromise, but I think it would be intended as a reason to push buyers up to the new model. I don't see MacBook Air getting a physical redesign in the next 12 months, but there could be an option for 5G to be added to these devices once Apple's own modem production begins based on the business they bought from Intel for mobile modems though this may need some wireless signal windows adding in too. And of course, that would just make it even more powerful for field-based sales teams. Okay, on to the MacBook Pro. MacBook Pro 13-inch packs the same M1 SoC as the MacBook Air, but with the addition of active cooling, the Marmite touch bar, a brighter display, and even longer battery life. One difference here, though, is that Apple has only replaced the base model of the 13 inch MacBook Pro, but kept the higher tier MacBook Pros around, which have four Thunderbolt 3 ports. This suggests there could be another level on the way for the smaller MacBook Pro models. Apple is likely to reveal redesigned MacBook Pro models in spring of 2021, bringing with it the first step up in performance of Apple Silicon after the M1 to what we'll call here M1X. It could well be the name, but we just don't know yet. Rumour has it that M1X will feature an increase to 12 cores, 4 high efficiency and 8 high performance cores. That M1X should also allow more displays to be used with these devices and we're just about to talk about why performance will not be an issue with that at all. Now we should be able to calculate roughly where these M1X SoCs will fall in terms of performance from what we already have. The M1 MacBook Pro gets a single core score of 1696 and a multi-core score of 7321. 1696 by 4 performance cores gives us 6784, meaning the low performance cores are contributing 537 points. So by doubling what the high performance cores are doing to give from 4 to 8 performance cores, that gives us 13,568. Add in the 537 from the low performance cores and that gives us 14,105. 14,105 places it right between the highest spec iMac Pro and the 16 core Mac Pro, which by the way is insane. Now for a disclaimer, we don't know the core count, we don't know the clock speeds, but it seems reasonable as an assumption. Now that M1X certainly has the power to sit inside the 16 inch model too, completely obliterating the highest spec MacBook Pro with Intel, the Core i9-9980HK, which scores a pedestrian 6865. In terms of design though, come March, there could well be an overhaul for both the MacBook Pros in both sizes. For a long time, there have been rumors of the smaller MacBook trading up to a 14 inch display, but both are reportedly due to be among the first to get mini LED displays, which combine the strength of OLED's high contrast and high dynamic range, but without the worry of burn-in or uneven display brightness across the display. It would make sense for Apple to fully overhaul the design if they're making adjustments in any way, and both sizes could benefit from better FaceTime cameras or even Face ID, even though the thin notebook lid would probably struggle to fit the required components inside. Could we see something even more radical though? Apple has been awarded a number of patents for wirelessly charging accessories or phones through the palm rests of a notebook either side of the trackpad. And now with MagSafe, it could be a really practical option. Of course, you can't wirelessly charge through metal, so Apple may have to expand the glass of the trackpad all the way across the device to allow the charge through. We've seen these patents also being able to include a removable magnetic keyboard too, and I don't think that would be to use the space where it was for something else, like an extra display, but simply so that you can sit or stand more comfortably and ergonomically at a desk, potentially with the laptop on a stand, rather than having to carry an extra keyboard with you though I don't think this would come in the next 12 months. Also, I don't think Apple will redesign the base entry-level 13-inch MacBook Pro this year either. I think the M1 will keep that design 
M1X models will probably move up to the 14 inch design to begin with and then the M2 models may pick that up later in the year. There's also a chance that Apple would bring their adaptive refresh rate ProMotion to their MacBook Pro line, being able to get right up to 120 hertz. While I've been famously fairly controversial by not actually caring about this on iPhones, I think it is something that's worth pursuing on the Macs. With the kind of power that the M1X would be packing, these things will be absolutely great for gaming, and hopefully we'll see a number of larger game developers bringing their titles natively to Apple Silicon. Just probably not Epic and Fortnite for a while. Moving on to Mac Mini. Now I have just ordered an M1 Mac Mini to replace my 27 inch iMac desktop, but I do think that Apple has more to come for Mac Mini before the end of 2021. I think that when M1X arrives, there will be a Mac Mini available with exactly that. And we should most likely be seeing the return of the space gray color in these higher spec versions of the Mac Mini. Now this could well be branded as a Mac Mini Pro or even Mac Mini X. I kind of like the idea of just sticking an X on the M1X stuff, which would just be a nice naming convention to know this is the more powerful version. I'd also be interested to see what Apple does in terms of expandability with the Mac Mini. While I don't expect that existing eGPUs with NVIDIA or AMD cards will get support on Apple Silicon, I could see Apple producing an eGPU of their own, maybe even in the same form factor as a Mac Mini, so they could be stacked on the desktop. As reports have shown that Apple is working on 16, 32, 64 and 128 core GPUs, most likely for the Mac Pro, which we'll be talking about later in this video. No reason they couldn't put those into a Mac Mini enclosure if they wanted to. So on that topic, Apple could go all in on that system and offer SSD raids in the same enclosure, afterburner style cards, maybe even more. What would you like to see in one of these? Or perhaps just stacking uh, two Mac Minis or three Mac Minis could be used as a single system, just with more power. Let me know, tell me in the comments. Come the M2 refresh later this year, I think that Mac Mini SE should really be a thing too. The current Mac Mini has a lot of empty space inside and it uses the same 150 watt power supply as the Intel models, even though the system could probably manage with about 30 watts. Shrink the board, smaller or maybe even no fan, the MacBook Air manages without one, and put it in something that looks a lot like our current Apple TV, throw a $499 or pound price tag at it, and make it an easy choice to bring the Mac to more people. Make it the default choice with an M1 inside for kids' bedrooms so that their TV can double as a computer for homework. It makes all the sense in the world, and I'd put money on a lot of younger people being faster at even typing on a phone than they are on a real keyboard too. So let the iPhone connect as a Bluetooth keyboard as it does with Apple TV even if only as one option. Okay, let's move on to the iMac. iMac is another perfect candidate for M1X, as well as being overdue a redesign, so let's get down to it. We should be looking again at March to April window, I think, with bigger displays, iPad Pro style design language, so expect something between a large iPad on a stick and the current Pro Display XDR being slimmed down slightly. The bigger display sizes are expected to be between 24 and 25 inch and 30 to 32 inch, which sounds pretty amazing, and I'd guess that we could get 5K and 6K resolutions on these, as otherwise keeping the 4K on the smaller size would just reduce pixel density, and the same with 5K. Hopefully 6K yields have increased now, and even if the display isn't quite as nice as the Pro Display XDR, that extra screen space is always going to be welcome. I'd love to see Apple bring their MagSafe charging to the foot of the iMac too, not just for topping up your iPhone at the desk, but also as a place to charge a new generation of the Magic Mouse, Magic Keyboard, and maybe even the Magic Trackpad. Anything but putting a lightning cable into the bottom of a mouse. Speaking of the Magic Keyboard, a few people have suggested these getting a touch bar or touch ID, but I think that would add way too much cost to the device as they'd need an A12 type chip inside in order to drive something like that along with its secure enclave. That will add to battery drain, etc. So it seems much more likely that the iMac, given its much thicker design than the notebooks, could actually step up to a 4K FaceTime camera lifted from the iPhone along with Face ID for authentication. And I still think it would be a great way to do family authentication. Whoever sits down at the computer, it just logs in as you. Same in schools. I'd also still love to see Apple Pencil support for an iMac that can swing down into a drawing board format, though potentially that could be reserved for iMac Pro if that line survives the move to Apple Silicon. Speaking of iMac Pro, if it does hang around as an option, perhaps it could get the actual Pro Display XDR technology built in, giving a super premium display, huge peak and sustained brightness, and beautiful industrial design. I'm not convinced that we need an iMac Pro as it was because it was there to fill a gap in the product line before the Mac Pro was released back in 2018. But 
Speaking of Mac Pro, Mac Pro with Apple Silicon. Now, whether we see or hear about a Mac Pro with Apple Silicon in 2021 or not, I just don't know. But my best guess would be that we have an announcement at WWDC in June and it releases late in 2021 with the huge core count based on M2 architecture. M2 will still be based on TSMC's 5 nanometer process, but just with the generational improvements and the other modules added around the cores. Mac Pro is probably the only system that I see Apple allowing to keep off-chip memory modules, but that will probably work as another level above the SoC's unified memory that will also be included for super fast processing. Think of it like L1, L2 and L3 caches, they get progressively larger and slower, but this would be another level above the unified onboard memory. Reports also say that there will be a smaller enclosure created for the Apple Silicon version, but in a consistent design style, which means Apple is still expecting a decent amount of heat management to be required, most likely coming down to all those cores all those cores. Now, reports have been coming out from Bloomberg that mentioned 12, 16 and 32 performance cores. So those would be on top of the high efficiency cores, which Apple may well still keep on these systems to keep temperatures low until the high performance Firestorm cores are required so that the heat sinks don't become saturated. Now, assuming the performance scales linearly with cores, 12 performance core versions would offer 20,889 points. A 16 core SOC would give 27,673 and 32 cores a massive 54,809. These are all Geekbench scores, by the way. Now, they probably won't scale linearly, but for context, Geekbench's highest score right now is the AMD Ryzen Threadripper 3990X with 64 cores and it scores 24,890. Less than half. I'll just leave that here. So as you can see, 2021 is going to be an incredibly exciting year for Apple Silicon and for the Mac in general. I don't think we will see any more Intel Macs. I really don't. For anyone that's been paying attention, why would you even consider buying an Intel Mac when the performance levels are going to be this good on Apple Silicon? I don't quite get it. I know there are people out there that need to use Windows, and for those people, I would actually say, don't buy a Mac then. Buy a Windows PC and an M1 or an Apple Silicon Mac. It just doesn't make sense to handicap yourself on the Mac side if that's what you're gonna be using most of the time just for the sake of, I just need these three Windows apps to work like twice a week. Like for those things, have a separate system that you can do those activities on and do the rest of your stuff on the better Mac. It just makes so much more sense to me. But is there something huge that I'm missing here? I know the compatibility is now improving on uh, Apple Silicon natively and certainly with Rosetta stuff but I know it's not 100% there yet, and is there anyone out there that is still thinking I'm just gonna go out and buy an Intel one? I would be really interested to know, but let me know your thoughts on all of the stuff that we've just talked about. If you want that shout out at the end of the next video, make sure you join the notification squad and leave that hashtag down in my comments section, and thank you all so much for watching.